my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Professor Alan McAworth. Um, I have a very long list of Alan's accomplishments here. Um, I checked with him before and he asked me to not read that list because otherwise I might be using up the majority of his slot. And while this might be very interesting for you and worthwhile, I strongly believe what Alan has to say is even more interesting. So I'll, I'll try to keep to the basics and uh, I ask your forgiveness if uh, one of Alan's many distinctions that is particularly relevant to you um, is one of the ones that, that I chose not to highlight. So um, Alan has been here for a very, very long time. Um, he currently holds uh, a Canada Research Chair in AI and is a full professor at our department. Um, previously, um, he studied at the University of Toronto at Harvard and got uh, his doctoral degree from Sussex. Um, a very long time at UBC means just to quantify at least that bit since 1974. Looking around the room, I would think many of you weren't even born then. Um, and uh, when he arrived at UBC, he did something absolutely marvelous with long-lasting effects. Um, he founded um, LCI and uh, became its first director. And as we all know, LCI is one of the uh, thriving research groups within our department, and, and this certainly goes to Alan's credit. Um, Beyond UBC, Alan is very well known um, for having pioneered constraint-based AI. In fact, uh, just earlier this year, um, his work in that area was recognized um, with the um, AIJ Classic Paper Award, which arguably is the most important single paper award in all of AI. Um, and that award Alan got for a single authored paper from 1977 that essentially um, gave birth to the entire field of constraint programming. Um, he is also the co-author of a major tax textbook in AI. Um, he served as president for pretty much any AI organization that is of relevance to this part of the world. So uh, he's been the president of the Canadian AI Association, um, of Triple AI, and also of ICHTAI, the big international joint conferences on AI uh, organization. Um, he also is a fellow of uh, the Canadian AI Association of Triple AI and of the Canadian, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Um, as well as a fellow of the Royal Society, which is probably the crowning achievement for a scientist in Canada. Um, Alan's research interests are broad, and he has made contributions in many different areas of AI and its applications. Um, applications that Alan used to be interested in and still is interested uh, in our vision, robotics, and particularly robot soccer, sort of bears the hallmark of uh, his contributions, um, but also assistive technologies, and most recently computational sustainability, which is a topic um, that I think is of particular relevance to us nowadays, obviously is, is very much aligned with UBC's priorities, with the priorities of the city of Vancouver, um, this province and this country indeed. So it's wonderful to have somebody of Alan's caliber and with his, with his deep experience in AI and all the uh, technologies that can enable computational sustainability talk to us about this particular topic. With this, it's my particular pleasure to welcome Alan. Thanks, Holger. I wish you'd kept it a little shorter, but <laughs> that was fine. In fact, I have Holger to thank for stimulating part of my interest in this field. So, um, Computation and sustainability, these are probably the two most important forces affecting social change in our society now. So it seemed like a reasonable thing to think about what is their connection, you know, what is their interrelationship. And when you say computation and sustainability in roughly the same breath, people say, oh yeah, green IT, I know what that is. Right? It's reducing the impact of computing on the environment computing with less energy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's part of it, but it's really a small part of it. And so that's part of what my thesis will be uh, today. So let me just run through a quick history. I'm going to look at first at sustainability. That's the structure of the talk. I'll look at that first, and then I'll look at computation, and then I'll look at how they come together, and then where it's going from here. So. We could go a long way back with sustainability, but one of the first works in sustainability was by uh, Malthus, who uh, talked about the imbalance between the population and the food supply, right? So he had an essay on the principle of population. And there's a wonderful quote saying, the natural inequality of the two powers of population and of production of the earth and that great law of our nature, which must constantly keep their effects equal, form the great difficulty. 
So what he's talking about are, in our language, two dynamical systems, namely the population system and the food system. They are coupled because people are need to produce food and they consume food. And there's a constraint, the great law of nature, which must constantly keep their effects equal. I love this phrase for reasons that Holger alluded to. This is all about constraint-based uh, sustainability. So right at the beginning, we have this idea of a constraint between two dynamical systems that are evolving in time. And what are the consequences of that constraint being enforced? I could go through the whole history of environmentalism. We know that Silent Spring was one of the first, uh, in North America at least, awakenings of, of the impact of the uh, pesticides on the environment. Uh, the Club of Rome did an analysis of, again, from a dynamical systems point of view, of uh, the effect on the environment of population growth and energy management and so on and so forth. Right in Vancouver, Greenpeace was started here, uh, initially concerned with uh, nuclear testing in the, uh, you know, in the Alaska waters, but going on to be a very powerful uh, social movement. The idea of limits to growth out of an MIT study, again, being more uh, analytical about the dynamical systems approach to what are the limits to growth? You know, can we have a, an economy that grows forever? Are there any limits to that? Well, there's obviously we're on a finite planet and so on and so forth. Uh, some of their predictions turned out to be wrong and there was there's a retrospective later which came back to revise some of those predictions. And then Brundtland came up with the idea of, of sustainable development uh, in our common future, which was a, a UN-sponsored uh, report thinking that we could have growth, namely development, as long as it's sustainable. And we'll have to unpack that word sustainable later. And then, of course, the impact on climate formed to the uh, formation of this intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC. And they've issued a series of reports which have been somewhat controversial and some of their foundations have been questioned. And there's some interesting computer science questions there about why some of their earlier predictions didn't work too well. Uh, so there's the first report, the uh, 2007 IPCC, uh, followed up by the UNEP report on the environment and outlook. And this was the uh, study I referred to as the reevaluation of the limits to growth. And it's really worth reading that if you're interested in this uh, approach to the problem. And then finally, they just released the first volume, really, of the uh, uh, IPCC 2013. Um, report looking at the physical science basis of climate change and looking at making a much more rigorous assessment of the underlying assessments and forecasts, look, you know, looking at the uh, error bounds and so on. So as so I said, this report, Our Common Future in 1987, talked about sustainable development, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So in order to do that, you have to think both about the environment and about the economy and about society because these things don't occur in a vacuum. They're, and many of these issues are deeply intertwingled. So obviously, any natural system is required to support human society. And an economy only exists within a human society. You can't talk about the environment and the economy as being you know, mutually opposed to each other. You can't have an economy without an environment. Right? You can't have one without a society. And you can't change the economy without changing the society. So these issues are fairly deep and fairly broad. In fact, they're probably the broadest and deepest issues we have to deal with. So let's look at these terms that we're throwing around. What is sustainability? So one definition would be the ability to maintain a balance of a process in a system. So we're talking about a dynamical system that's evolving over time because it's a process that's changing. There are resources that this process is, is consuming and producing and so on. And we want to somehow make sure this can continue. So if we talk about an ecosystem, then we're talking about ecological sustainability, which is what many people mean by sustainability. But I'm going to use a broader sense of sustainability in this talk. So by ecological sustainability, we mean the ability of an ecosystem, which would include humans, to maintain ecological processes, functions, biodiversity, and productivity into the future. And then human sustainability comes back to this idea of sustainable development that Brundtland introduced, namely the ability to meet the needs of the present, and here humans are understood, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 
Okay, so that requires balancing many processes. Another important concept, which actually was developed here at UBC by Buzz Holling, who was a really amazing scientist, who talked about resilience. And again, he's talking about dynamical system. What is resilience? An ecosystem is res if it has the capacity to tolerate disturbances without collapsing into a qualitatively different state. In dynamical systems language, we talk about you know, it being in a basin of an attractor where it's stable within that basin. But if there are outside disturbances, it may force it into some other basin which may have very deleterious consequences. But he's talking about systems that include social systems. So in that case, the humans in the loop can anticipate and plan for the future. So in fact, we can, you know, it's meta. You can study the system that you're involved in, and you can take measures to make sure the system is more resilient, right? Because we have that ability as humans. So what is resilience? When you apply it, whether to just, you know, natural ecosystems or integrated systems of people in the natural environment, you typically have these three characteristics. The system can undergo a certain amount of change, the, the more the better, and still remain the same controls on function and structure. You can still control it if you're thinking of it as a, as a system where you're controlling it from the outside. He also asked that it be capable of self-organization self and it be, have the ability to build and increase its capacity for learning and adaptation. Okay, so that's one way that he thought that, that systems should be resilient. Now he's built a large body of work based on that by studying particular systems and deciding when they were and when they weren't resilient, what, what factors led to more resilience. So that's just a quick overview of sustainability in its, in its forms. As I say, I'm going to use it in its wider form, which includes human sustainability, social sustainability. So let's take a quick look at the other side of the equation, computation. Don't need to say much here. We all know, it's, you know it keeps growing about 100 times a decade. Not only is the basic you know, memory power and, and speed increasing, but we're also seeing sensors and actuators and the capacity to build and collect and process big data and communication networks are now spanning the globe. We have what Teo de Chardin called the new sphere. We've basically externalized our brains and we're communicating one giant global brain. We've built huge software systems. They're not always reliable. They crash every now and then, quite regularly, some of them. But we, we can at least know, we know how to build these things for, for large-scale commerce adventures like Amazon, uh, logistics and supply, supply chains have been optimized. We have massive search engines which give us you know, information at the tip of our fingers, and so on and so forth. What's happening next? Well, computers are going to disappear, right? sort of paradoxically. Just as in the machine age, motors disappeared into fridges and elevators and all the rest of it. So computers are disappearing. They're going to things, the internet of things, smart matter, personal transit, et cetera, et cetera. Ubiquitous computing. Mark Weiser predicted this 30 years ago. It's happening. So we're surfing the wave of innovation. So brief history of computer science. And I'm going to offend some people with this brief history, but this is all personal view. Um, in the early days, the focus of computer science was making computers more efficient because we had very small computers, like 32K of memory, you know, one MIP, if you were lucky, you know, 1K uh, uh, processors and so on. So we wanted to make them more efficient, easier to program, so we didn't have to program in machine language. We went to Fortran, then Algol, and then whatever's Java. OSs, compilers, programming language complexity theories, all of those you can see as, as we're trying to cope with these tools that we've developed and make them easier to use by ourselves, primarily as programmers or whatever, or as analysts. So you can think of that as inward looking. And then you, the next phase could be thought of as more outward looking. So we want computers to make computers smarter so they're easier to interact with. So it's not just AI and machine learning, but HCI becomes critically important here. You know, Ivan Sutherland, et cetera, all of that history back from the 60s on was in this second phase leading to robotics, as we're seeing now, as robotics is finally, after 50 years of saying it'll happen in 10 years, it's happening now. So what's next? Mobile ecosystems, social networks, smart buildings, all this stuff that Google's doing. They're doing all of this, I think, except household robots. But now ubiquitous robotics is coming 
shortly from several companies. So computational thinking is now pervasive. I mean, it's not just pervasive in the world. It's pervasive in the university, or at least it should be. Um, whereas we used to be peripheral. Like, this is the only formula in the talk, right? But this says that for every field in the university, x, there's another field, y, that is computational x. And you, you can see this. You see people saying, I'm doing computational science, computational physics, blah, 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 blah. All of that, right? Every one of these is like a subdiscipline within those disciplines. So we're taking over, okay? Which is, we knew it was going to happen, but now it is happening. So we're transforming the university, society, and the economy all at once. So that's what I mean by when I say this is one of the most powerful forces transforming our society. So now let's look at where sustainability and computation come together. And the first place they come together is, is in so-called green IT, and I go to the source of all knowledge and see that green IT means designing, manufacturing, using, and disposing of computers, servers, and associated subsystems, blah, blah, efficiently and effectively with minimal or no impact on the environment. Okay? So this is a very important uh, discipline, very practical discipline, looking at things like life cycle design, what's the you know, cradle to grave design of systems, to see how they're used, how they can be minimally uh, used resources, and so on. So which requires you to build modular replaceable systems, like we're not getting with our phones and so on, right? Very hard to fix your iPhone deliberately. So we need a lot more work in this area. A lot of work on low power chips, because the biggest constraint in, it, in a mobile device is power consumption, not speed. So there's been a lot of development here. And even low powered programming, what does that look like? Cloud computing is a way of using resources efficiently, designing your server farms so they're efficient, so they're close to ecological sources of power, like in Washington State, so on all the load balancing techniques. All of that's very important, very important, but it's not what I'm going to talk about. And of course, the ugly side of, of our field is e-waste, which we know is causing a huge impact on the environment, the way we built all these non-recyclable, non-modular, uh, very quickly designed to be obsolete systems that get thrown away and put in your drawers um, or shipped to the third world where they cause all sorts of environmental problems. That's all a very important issue. But I think what's more important is the big picture. If you focus on that issue, you're going to miss the big picture, which is that computation is, in a, in a way, the revolution we're involved in is all about dematerialization. Okay, it's called the atoms to bits, right? That there's a dynamic here which is inherently sustainable. So you think about everything that's happened in the last 20 or 30 years and what's going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years. We're using fewer and fewer resources because of computational power and the communications power that we have. So the post office is going under because we're all emailing and texting. Ebooks are a big deal. All these photography stores and Kodak's gone out of business. Blockbuster just closed its last store yesterday, I think. Um, and there's even some really interesting evidence that people are driving less. Teenagers aren't as keen to get their licenses, driving license. For us, that was a mark of transition to manhood, was getting your driver's license on your 16th birthday and getting your car on the, the day after that. You could. It's not such a big deal for teenagers today. They seem to communicate and get around and you know, uh, construct their social networks. We used to construct our social networks by going down to the drive-in, getting a hamburger, and then going to the drive-in movie. You, know, you had to have a car to do all that. So Skype, Facebook, and Twitter are replacing many of these things. And actually, the number, you know, the amount of driving going on in Greater Vancouver is actually dropping while well, a provincial government is proposing to spend untold billions and has spent untold billions on building new bridges, new highways, et cetera, et cetera. And then they're going to force us to have a referendum on the transit, end of political state. So green IT is worthwhile and important, but dematerialization is much more significant. We have to keep our eye on that prize. So, Apart from that, there's this whole new area of computational sustainability that's been developing. And again, we'll go for a definition first. 
it's very interdisciplinary. It's not just about computer science because it applies techniques from computer science, information science, OR, applied math, stats, for balancing environmental, societal, and economic needs for sustainable development. Again, human sustainability is part of the definition. And so lots of, there's lots of things like optimization involved here, coming from OR, all the classic techniques of, of OR, combined perhaps with con in constraint programming. So we'll look at some examples of this, but again, I want to, s to look at the big picture first. There, there are really two kinds of computational sustainability. There's the kind that I just hinted at, namely when you're developing computational models and methods for decision making for the management and allocation of ecosystem resources. Okay, so this might be energy management or how to harvest the forest efficiently uh, while maintaining the eco biodiversity of the forest and, and et cetera, et cetera, using computational models. The other approach is, and I'll call this the model approach, this is the embedded approach where you actually, computation is directly in the loop. So we're talking about systems where uh, there may be uh, a control system at the lower levels of, of the loop. You might be managing the energy system in your house. But this, at the higher levels, the system knows what your habits are and reasons about your habits and tries to adapt. You know, if it anticipates you coming home at 5.30, it'll try to turn the heat on at 4.30 so the house is warm, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be in the loop embedded system, okay? And I think these are quite different approaches. But what they all have at the core, you'll be surprised to know, is constraint satisfaction. So let me say just a little bit about constraint satisfaction before I get back to looking at computational sustainability. You want to, what I'm going to try and do in computational sustainability is sort of sketch a design space, sketch some dimensions for that space, look at some case studies in, in the space. But this is some work that we've been doing for quite a while. So um, we talk about constraint-based agents. And we think the best way to design an intelligent system is, to, is again, not to, to start coding, but to say, what constraints should this, system, should this system satisfy? What are those constraints? Let's write them down. And let's see which ones are in conflict and which ones are not in conflict. Let's design constraint satisfiers, which is our fancy word for a controller, to satisfy those constraints. And in the early days in AI, we were all about static constraints, like solving crossword puzzles or whatever. You know? but that was a bit boring, so we went into more dynamic worlds and we proposed soccer playing robots and that's become this huge RoboCup event every year with 2,000 robots and 1,000 people all competing in robot soccer. And we developed this theory of constraint-based agent design to, d to design agents that were operating in highly dynamic worlds where you have to act, act very quickly to changes in the world, but at the same time you also have to plan. So the critical issue there is how do you combine planning with reacting? We know how to do AI planning really well, as you know, you learn all about it in 322. But combining that with a system that can also cope with unexpected breakdowns in the world, or life is what happens when you're making your plans, you know, then that's the hard part. So we designed an, an architecture, we tried to do that. So the thesis here is that often we fail to recognize what constraints we're trying to satisfy. And once we've designed those systems, designed a system to satisfy the constraints, we actually start proving theorems about them in temporal logic to prove that you know, they always eventually satisfy the constraints. But I'm not going to go into that here. So this is the, the typical model that any agent is always operating in an environment and will be designed with respect to that environment. That's what evolution does, for example. Right? So any agent will act on an environment. The, agent, the environment will act on the agent. So these are symmetrical. Okay, the agent could be anything from a robot to a bacterium, a human, or all of human kind, which is maybe may talking about when we're talking about global scale ecosystems. So where do these constraints come from? Well, typically an agent has constraints from its own internal structure. You know, my arms are connected to my torso and, and my legs are connected to my hips. I can't change that structure. Its goals and preferences may be more flexible. Uh, its external environment imposes constraints on me. I cannot, as much as I want to, move through this bench. 
and finally, the really interesting ones are where you couple your internal world and your external world. So you can separate any agent in a constrained environment, separate those constraints into these four kinds. And if you don't, if the agent doesn't respect and satisfy those constraints, it'll be out of kilter. Okay, it'll crash in some form. So typically a constraint-based agent, we unpack the agent into a body and a controller. Now I think of the controller as a constraint solver. Simple case, a thermostat, right? Where you're trying to set the actual temperature of the room to the desired temperature of the room. And that's a very simple equation to be solved as a constraint by the controller up here. But in general, of course, you're going to have multi-level controllers. Each controller will see a virtual body below it and can think at a very high level. So this controller typically would be operating on very long time horizons, but with a very slow clock that is checking over only every now and then. Whereas this one would be on a very short time horizon. This might be a PID controller controlling the, you know, the anti-lock braking system in your car. Or whatever. It doesn't think very far ahead unlike the uh, cruise control, the intelligent cruise control, which is using radar to lock onto the car ahead. That has to think further ahead. So that's the typical architecture which you'll find in, in these kinds of systems. And finally, what do I mean by constraint satisfaction? Well, again, we want to think about dynamical systems. These systems are operating in time. They may be discrete or they may be continuous, operating in discrete or continuous time. So you might have hybrid systems. And here's a very simple example. Suppose I don't know, you want to kick a ball. And in this dynamical system, two of the variables are where your foot is and where the ball is, right? So minimally, if you want to kick a ball, your foot has to be where the ball is. So you have to be on the y equals x 45 degree line here. So if this is an attractor of this dynamical system, if all the flow lines go towards that line, they may not actually meet it, but they may not get within epsilon of it, then you could say you will kick the ball eventually. You may, not, you may or may not have a guarantee on how long it'll take you to kick the ball. It may take a very long time to asymptote to that, to that line. But if they all go there, you will always eventually kick the ball. So that's what we mean by satisfy a constraint. A coupled agent environment system satisfies a constraint if the constraint solution set, y equals x here, in the phase space of the coupled hybrid dynamical system, coupled between the agent and the environment, is an attractor of the single system, which is the coupling of the agent system with the environment system. Okay? That's about as technical as we're going to get in this talk. So take that idea, or those set of sets of ideas, and lift them to this idea of sustainability. What are the constraints? Well, again, there are multiple levels, right? Any sustainable system must satisfy various physical, chemical, biological, psychological, social, and economic constraints, at least. And probably more that I forgot about. And we've been, we, that is the human, humankind, has been taught worrying about energy supply, waste management, greenhouse gases, ocean acidity, ocean temperature, climate, ecological footprint, biodiversity, you name it. And here are the two that Malthus was worried about, food supply and population size. We seem to have even more to worry about than he did. And most importantly, global equity. You cannot ignore inequity in the society or in the global system between different societies. For example, you know, if we'll see that the United States has already used up, by 1936, had used up its fair share of the carbon budget of the planet, right? Whereas China and India haven't come close. So what do you do now going forward? How do you deal with this global equity problem? And it comes back all the way. But, but this is the central message of the talk, that these kinds of constraints and involving these kinds of variables are the ones we have to satisfy. So sustainability is constraint satisfaction. I mean, not surprising, this is my hammer, so everything looks <coughs> like that now. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Do you see any aspect of sustainability going beyond computation? You made a very compelling case that... Uh, For sure, yeah. There are obviously things like, you know, there are standard differential equations at the very lowest level in, in ocean acidity, say, you know, which we, I mean, you don't need computation to model. You don't have to put computation in the loop. You don't need computational models of it. Right. But on the other hand, you could argue that, I mean, if Uri is here, I don't know if he is, but... Um, 
that scientific computation is at the very heart of, of sustainability because all these climate models rely on various forms of numerical computation and a lot of them are badly conditioned and, and they didn't consider the sources of error and so on and so forth. So I think it's much, it's, computation is more deeply embedded in sustainability than anyone suspected. So this is a really nice paper, uh, Rockstrom 09, on planetary boundaries, which gives you this idea as planetary boundaries as constraints. They have 10 different aspects of the global system. Here's the safe operating region in green. As long as you stand inside that envelope, you're OK. Unfortunately, in 2009, biodiversity loss is out here, the nitrogen cycles out there, climate change is out there, as we already know. Right? So we're going to somehow have to get back inside the safe operating region. How do we do that? But then there's a, there is this idea of a safe operating space. And now we're thinking there, the planet is a dynamical system. It has 10 important variables. It's a 10 dimensional phase space. The safe operating space is an envelope where he's, as long as you're within the limits for each of those biophysical constraints, we're not even talking about biological and social constraints in this model, then you're OK. And the good news, of course, is that many of these systems do display resilience in Holling's sense, right? And Lovelock had a more fancy word for it. He called it the Gaia principle. That he said the, you know, the planet is basically a living organism, and it will always come back to a stable, stable position. It will, in fact, take care of itself, arguably. And he had this beautiful model in the daisy world. It was a very neat computational model. The world is covered with white and black daisies, and they absorb the solar rays at different rates. And you know, look it up. It's really cool. Anyway, many of these systems will display resilience in that they will resist moving away from homeostasis, moving back to an equilibrium. They'll go back to the basin of attraction. But if you go too far, they'll tip into a new basin of attraction, which may represent abrupt environmental change, for example, collapse. And we know, and we've seen many ecosystems collapse. And so here's a good example from the same paper, actually. So here we're thinking about various control variables on the x-axis. You could think of the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, which causes you know, greenhouse gas problems. And as long as you keep it down to low levels, the response variable, in this case, the extent of land ice cover, is flat. It's, it's homeostatic. It's a resisting change. But as soon as you go past the threshold, you can lead very quickly to collapse. Because then you start to get positive feedback cycles, you know, like as the ice melts away, then there's less heat being reflected, more being absorbed, which will heat the air, and so on and so forth. So that's not atypical. And here's the biggie, the carbon constraint. The one, million, one trillion tons. These are metric tons. That's why it's spelled that way. Um, so at the Copenhagen conference, it was decided we should limit global warming from pre-industrial days to now by 2 degrees C. Um, and now they've quantified that. The report just released said, in order to do that, the total cumulative carbon emissions must be less than 1 trillion. That's 1,000 thousand million tons. And there's actually a website here, a beautiful website at Oxford, that will show you how many tons have been emitted at any second of time. So, so far, when I looked it up yesterday, there were 574 billion tons emitted so far. So we're, we're getting there. We're always halfway there, more than halfway to the total cap. And if things go the way they're going, then could be a trillion tons emitted by then, at which point we have to stop totally. We have to be in total zero carbon economy at that point. So we've got a problem. We have a cap of a trillion. We've got this many gone already. So we've got this many to go, 426 billion. How do we allocate those? You know, we still have nation states, unfortunately. So the nations are going to enforce any caps. And you know, this talk about unintended consequences. I mean, we, just as in computation, sustainability has this big unintended consequence. We've been burning fossil fuels for three centuries, which we've been using up this capital supply for fossil fuels. And they're going to run out soon. In fact, before they run out, with the unintended side effect is we may hit the planet beyond uh, where we would want to live on. 
least certainly in the tropical zones. So you can only use 426 billion of these 1 trillion, and you know what we're doing in BC and Alberta, okay? So here's this global equity issue. The USA used its per capita share by 1936. You know, if you divide what's being used or by what's going to be available by the population, you get that. So now we have a political issue. Where do you set the starting point? You know, do you set it back in the 17th century or do you set it right now and just say, well, let's forget about the past and let's just be fair going forward, get everyone on the planet a carbon budget. And there are a lot of assumptions in this argument. I don't have the time to go into them, but all sorts of other greenhouse gases capture, you know, the ocean and, and uh, the earth capture maybe 50% of the gases we emit uh, so far, but that's going to decline. Permafrost melting, carbon capture and storage. You know, people say, well, you could capture all that carbon and store it, and you could do geoengineering. So I'm not going to go into those. But so this is an interesting computational issue here. So this shows the annual consumption or annual production of carbon in gigatons, right? Here, by country. Here's the USA, bottom, and OECD without the USA, and so on. Um, and up here is shown the tons of carbon per capita. So here's the USA up there at about six tons of carbon per capita per year uh, down to India here. So they have this theory, this, this Global Commons Institute is proposing a con convergence and contraction policy. Namely that, well, we can't instantly drop the USA down to here, but they got to do it pretty quickly. So you'll have this convergence where eventually you get to equity here, where everyone is using the same amount per capita. And then, of course, we all have to contract. You know, this, this would be, if you integrate that curve, you'll get the one trillion tons that you're allowed. Right? So, you know, that's again the constraint we have to satisfy. So let's step back and think about this design space. What can we do about these issues? Well, we can build systems, and there are various kinds of systems you could build. This might give you a framework for thinking about what, what would be effective. So I think there are maybe five or more dimensions. First, I've talked about levels. So we'll talk about the biophysical level, the biological level, the social level, the economic level. And of course, most systems operate with constraints at several levels. What domain are we talking about with application? Climate, ocean, fisheries, blah, blah, blah. What kind of type? I talked about the model approach or the embedded approach. And of course, we have a variety of spatial scales from nanometer down to global scales, up to global scales, and temporal scales. So these are important uh, distinctions. So I'll just give you some, some examples of systems that I find interesting. and. Uh, see what we can extract from that. First, obviously, is the climate model issue. This is a, a simulation done which showed the effect. Suppose you cut down all the tropical forests in the Amazon, Africa, and the Indian archipelago and converted them to bare ground. What would be the effect on global uh, surface changes? So here's a climate model combined to a land surface ecosystem. And these models are really, really quite sophisticated. Uh, showing the result of uh, a lot of heating where you'd expect it, where you're cutting down systems, and even more up here where you're not, but also some cooling in here. So there's some really interesting couplings, the ocean currents and the, the convective uh, atmospheric currents and so on, that produce sometimes uh, counterintuitive results. So this is, the, of course, the one of the big controversy. What is the actual prediction for uh, global warming? Uh, this is starting at roughly 2000. And this was just, just released in the assessment report number five by the IPCC. Um, I stole this from the draft report. So showing the temperature change relative to 86, 2005, ignoring the, the earlier changes. Right? So they're doing a fairly nice analysis of the uncertainty. Uh, and, analyzing it based on the internal variability of a model. So that is just natural climate variability called weather, for example. They're, they're, they're using many different models here to try and get consensus. So this, is, so this is the climate uncertainty. This is the model spread. 
And this is a convection pathway scenario spread, which is giving us the largest amount of uncertainty. But that's, you know, what kind of pathways are you going to model in terms of how the system is, uh, how the system feedback loops work? And what amplitudes do they have? So a little Canadian content. Um, so Lawrence Mitak, who was also at UBC, um, now at McGill, uh, is predicting we may not have no more outdoor skating soon. I mean, these are not important changes, but they're symptomatic. Right? We've already seen, you know, it's, it's already the case that outdoor hockey is, is, uh, is already limited. I like this one because it's also got Canadian content. It's actually a company in California that built a robot um, that could traverse the ocean, went to Hawaii, eventually got to Japan, um, using only ocean wave energy for propulsion and solar energy to power sensors and transmitters. James Gosling was involved in this. Here's a quote from James, who designed and uh, implemented Java when he was with Sun. Now he's working for these guys. He says it's a rocket science problem, a large data problem, a large scale control problem, both of which have been passions of mine for years. It's w worth looking this up. It's very cool how it just go by going up and down, this sort of Venetian blind thing that's hanging underneath will actually always propel it forward. It goes slowly, like one or two knots, but who cares? But it, it's monitoring the ocean as it goes, of course, sending back temperature and acidity, very important ecological readings. Uh, here's another example of, again, sort of involves Canada. Canada's up here, but this is the US uh, part of it. What about the grizzly bear? So what are the grizzlies going to do when it gets warmer, as it is getting warmer? Uh, we want pathways for them. So they either have to go north or they have to go higher, right? To get into a, a to keep the same temperature variation. So they've got three reserves already, these green ones. The really interesting optimization problem is given the cost of land around in the red area, what's the cheapest way to build a resilient connection for the grizzly bear? Right? So you need wildlife corridors. And this is going on all over the place. People are building corridors. Typically, they go north to allow populations to migrate. Um, here's another one. This acts, uh, and they're extending this into the Canadian Rockies as well. So here's migratory bird flyways. Um, so you know the Rifle Bird Sanctuary, the Fraser River Delta, et cetera, are critical components of flyways for birds going up and down from the Arctic down to Mexico or South America. And so again, how much of that land should we preserve? You know, should we put a coal port on the Fraser River estuary, which is being proposed, or should we keep that for the birds? There's some really interesting trade-offs involved there. Uh, this was a talk we heard here a couple of years ago, tracking zebras, the social life of zebras. You know, so looking at social networks among zebras, again, to decide how should their uh, habitat be managed effectively. They were tracking with GPS collars, but you could do it with vision. Zebras have barcodes. It's kind of cool. Um, here's some machine learning. This is Coulter's work at MIT looking at, uh, suppose I, you had a smart meter on your home, which you probably do. Um, could I, from the outside, figure out when you turned on your washing machine, your dryer, your microwave, your television? The answer is yes, I could. By looking at the patterns, the typical patterns of energy use, and there are various, you know, you can either use supervised or unsupervised learning to do this, and it's done very effectively by, by these guys and these papers. I can give references, to, in fact, all these references are on my webpage. Um, so, what could you do with that? Well, you could feed that back to the householders so they could intelligently manage their own energy by looking at, you know, I, don't really need to put the washing machine on twice a day, et cetera, et cetera. Or I could put it on at 3 in the morning. They'd give me much cheaper power then, and so on and so forth. All sorts of work going on in the energy space. This is Cambridge. So I'm, not only that, they're looking at infrared images of the houses to figure out how good their insulation is, which would then could be correlated with their energy use. Again, another thing right on campus, the Sears building, smart building. Uh, using all sorts of eco-design and solar reflection and solar energy and wastewater recycling and totally instrumented building, et cetera, et cetera. Smart cars, we all know about Google's work and starting in the DARPA Urban Challenge, Sebastian Thrun, Red Whitaker. 
What's that got to do with sustainability? Well, it's got a hell of a lot to do with sustainability. If you could have been, you wouldn't probably want you know, these laser scanners and radar all over the place, but all the major manufacturers are doing this. They're really advanced in Germany. In fact, the, the first self-driving car was, was a Mercedes-Benz going down the Autobahn in the 1980s. It wasn't, you know, Google's just better at public relations. But think about the consequences for safety. How many hundreds of thousands of people have been killed by cars? Uh, the human driver could relax. You've got a huge increase in road capacity, which means fewer roads and bridges and so on and so forth because you can drive much closer together. That also gives you huge gains in fuel efficiency when you platoon. Um, we could share cars. Why do we all have to have a car which is sitting idle 95% of the time, consuming parking lots and all the rest of it? You know? um, we could have taxis that just come when you whistled on your iPhone. And the cars could talk to each other and coordinate. So, Peter Stone's done some really nice work at Texas on autonomous traffic control, some really interesting protocol issues. How would you manage a protocol for cars at intersections to make sure they could reserve a time and space slot to go through safely? And if they could do that, you could get away with stop signs and traffic lights and everything else if you relied on these systems. And you'd have to prove this protocol was free of deadlock and live lock and so on, which he's done, very nice work. Here's some work in urban design, again, done here. This is done at the Design Center for Sustainability. What are the constraints in urban design? Well, we talk about jobs. You want jobs where people live. You want high-density corridors with transit. Uh, but you want walkable systems. You want green space. You want infrastructure that's close to where it is, rather than sending all our sewage to Iona Island. Why don't we have local sewage plants, you know, which David Poole and Giuseppe Caranini and Gunella Oberg are working on here. Uh, we want a range of housing types so people can age in place, they can have their grandchildren or their, their granny can live with the, with the kids, etc. So Jen Fernquist, uh, Kelly Booth and I worked on a collaborative planning support system, which this is a, a city block in Vancouver, showing the extent to which the constraints are satisfied. They aren't being satisfied automatically, it's a design charrette where you get a bunch of students and our architects together and say, how can we make this work and satisfy all of those constraints? You can't satisfy them all. You've got to trade them off and so on. Uh, but this shows you the extent to which you're satisfying. Um, educational equity. You know, uh, students here are highly privileged. You know, what about people in Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera, who don't have access to the UBC resources? So MOOCs, Khan Academy, Udacity, blah, blah, blah. We worked on AI space, which is used all over the planet uh, for AI. Uh, Sebastian says, I'm against education. It's only available to the top 1% of all students. I want to empower the 99%. So he's an Occupy supporter. Education should be free, accessible for all, everywhere, and anytime. And so UBC is participating. Kevin Layton Brown taught a great game theory course. Gregor Cazales taught uh, an intro programming course. And the results are fairly spectacular. Of course, it's not the be all end all doesn't solve the problem, but it does make it much more accessible and equitable. This is just a slide showing our AI space work, which is widely used. I want to talk briefly about something else which you might not immediately think of as sustainability, but getting old is a problem. I can speak personally about that. But it's also a problem for the society. We have a rapidly aging population, and it's even worse in Japan, where you know, the number of people over 65 is going to be greater than the number of people under 25 soon, and so on and so forth. And people over 65 eventually have certain problems of mobility, uh, memory loss, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work going on in assistive technology. We had Ron Becker here recently talking about that. We've done some work in um, wheelchair mobility which contributes to this. If you had smarter wheelchairs, then people who are currently warehoused in long-term care facilities in a, in a manual wheelchair looking at television eight hours a day could actually regain some degree of autonomy and self-control over their lives. Or they might be able to stay in place longer in their home because they wouldn't need someone to wheel them around all the time. So we've done some work on wayfinding on the UBC campus. This is. Uh, how to get around on campus, and this is how to get around in this building. You know, fairly straightforward stuff. 
Um, this is Pooja Viswanathan's thesis on uh, a smart wheelchair. I'm with Jim Little, Ian Mitchell, and quite a few others. Showing that you can use computer vision and robot navigation and robot planning techniques and so-called simultaneous localization and mapping. This robot, which is a wheelchair, didn't have any clue as to what the environment looked like when it started out, but just by moving around and using vision and picking up David Lowe's SIFT features, it can actually learn the three-dimensional model of the environment, which it can then use to plan to, get, to go where it wants to go. Um, more local talent. This is a work that Kevin Layton Brown did when he was on sabbatical, uh, looking at crop disease monitoring in Uganda. Okay, So cassava looks like this when it's healthy, but it looks like this when it's sick. And you can actually learn or teach a system, a computer system, to recognize the difference. So what they did was, I guess people had cell phones. Kevin could tell us, but they had cell phones which taking pictures of cassava leaves all over Uganda or within the test site and classifying them and sending that back to head office where they would map it and uh, then they could figure out what you know, disease control strategies and so on and so forth. And I guess it would also help them with markets, right? They could figure out, is the price of cassava going to go up if it's a big disease? Did you do that? Uh, you could. Mostly it's about food security. It's an insurance crime. Yeah. OK, right. So the, the, mostly they're trying to figure out whether, when they should harvest it, because it's something you can leave in the ground for a long time. Right. So you can read all about it here. Um, I mean, IT is incredibly disruptive. There's an example in, in Africa. This is in India. Uh, this is a great book on how the cheap cell phone dischanges business, politics, and daily life. This is in India. Great Indian phone book. So, you know, if you're a fisherman working out of Cochin and you're coming back in with your fish harvest, in the old days, you just had to sell it to the one fish buyer. You had no choice to, but to take his price. Okay? Now, you could say, you could call the guys on land, various different brokers, and say, oh, this is what I got on board, what am I offered? So you can negotiate your price before you even hit the port. Right? So all sorts of examples of people creating markets for themselves where they didn't exist before, breaking up monopolies of uh, supply and demand. And again, another example of insurance. This, uh, this is work done through Cornell, uh, looking at uh, the Horn of Africa, northern Kenya, uh, Misabi district. So the problem is, if you've got a few uh, head of cattle, and there's a drought, and that's your entire capital resources in the world, you lose half your, your herd, you're basically wiped out, right? So could you get insurance? Well, it's very hard to arrange insurance in a situation like that. Um, but what they did was they used uh, satellite imaging to look at the grazing lands to see when they deteriorated to the point where herders are expected to lose more than 15% of their herd. At that point, you'd start paying indemnities to people in that region. Okay, presume they have to buy insurance, but they don't, you don't have to send out an insurance agent to inspect the crop and get them to show you the bodies and all the rest of it, right? It, it makes it feasible. So described there. And this just shows the local livestock owners grabbing to, grabbing to receive payouts for their, in their livestock insurance scheme. So it's making their lives more sustainable, more equitable, right? They're more likely to be able to survive. So I've sort of given you examples of many points in the space of uh, computational sustainable systems. I think it's worth thinking about how we could help as computer scientists. What is our obligation here? Is there any obligation? You could say no. But if you're interested in helping, there's all sorts of things you can do. And I've just given you a sample of a few things. Um, there's many important problems we could be solving. We are solving many trivial problems. Maybe we should switch a little bit of our focus, OK? Deal with some of these crises. Uh, all sorts of applications that have a direct contribution to sustainability. But think of sustainability in a broad sense, not, not just in terms of ecosystems. That's incredibly important. But how could we make the society more sustainable? How could we reduce the gap between the 1% and the 99%, et cetera, et cetera? How could we make resources more equitably available? And that is, so that includes things like assistive technology, right? 
memory aids and so on for, uh, for the elderly, smart wheelchairs, nurse assistants. There's, there's a lot of opportunity in that space as well. So the point is, this has got nothing to do with a particular area of computer science. There's every area of computer science could play this game. And it's a very important game. Uh, machine learning is prominent, but all of these systems must be built reliably. And one of the biggest problems with global warming modeling was that the systems were built using Fortran, a lot of them. Right? They were lousy pieces of code that were being patched and patched and repatched. Nobody had a clue what they were doing. They weren't in any sense verifiable. If you think about the, the opportunity to show, I can prove this program is correct, which we can now start to do, thanks to satisfiability and so on and so forth, right? So there's all sorts of, in every single area, scientific computing, all of these, many of these systems are based on solving interesting numerical problems, all sorts of algorithmic and theory problems there. So there's no shortage of opportunity. So that, I'll stop. I'd like to thank many, many people who are involved in these projects, a lot of my students, my colleagues, my collaborators. Uh, if you want to learn more, it's on this site here. And I got some money from some people. Thank you. I'm sure there are plenty of questions, and as it happens, we have plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, you know, a lot of the sustainability questions seem to be about. Uh, um, in some sense, you know, homeostasis a little bit, especially when the climate change. Uh, but if, if there is if there's evidence that there is change, then is there, are people looking at can you change it in a in kind of a, 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 a better than the past direction? Is there a, because if now it's just a control problem, and now you, you can choose what you. <laughs> well, yes. Um... I mean, there are all sorts of geoengineering proposals for, for climate change, right? That would propose, you know, putting iron in the oceans and, you know, changing cloud cover, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we could go to a zero carbon economy right away, then the planet would probably come back, um, getting out of my depth here, but it would probably come back to a, a better homeostasis than it's at now. Because it, there are some um, feedback cycles which tend to restore the balance. So even though it appears that we've overshot already, you know, if you look at the dynamics of the system and the way uh, the ocean sinks work and all the rest of it, uh, even if we went to zero carbon today, um, there'd be an overshoot, but then maybe we could bring it back, come back partly by itself, partly maybe we'll have to go to these other techniques of carbon capture and storage and, and geoengineering. And so on. One of the things I, I didn't find any mention of is how do you cope with legacy systems which are not smart, which are not sustainable as they currently stand? So this is a huge issue in uh, uh, software systems and therefore yeah. in this case also it should be a huge and very important issue. Yes. Any, any yeah. um, well you either throw them away and start again or um, you start small. I mean, you know, legacy system is our transportation system. The entire thing is built around the car. Um, and yet, just through computation, you look at car to go, moto, et cetera, we have three car co-ops in Vancouver, which are enormously successful, which are giving you much more sustainability in, in the car system. But they just started small, but they rely totally on computation, right? And you couldn't run any of these car sharing systems without computers. Um, so um, in some ways, because we have you know, the power we have in, in computation, and mobility, and networks, and you know, cell, cell communication, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we can build systems now we couldn't have conceived of, build, of building earlier, just as you can with self-driving cars. I mean, in some way, it would be sort of guerrilla-style incremental in that sense. These things just started up, and they're just slowly eating away at car ownership. I mean, there's evidence to show that already. Another way is through the manufacturers themselves. The, you know, AI is creeping into every car. 
right? The cars are getting smarter and smarter. But it's not like we're suddenly going to replace a dumb car with a smart car. What's going to happen is the brakes are going to get smarter, the steering's getting smarter, the, the headlights get smarter, the cruise control gets smarter, uh, the parking system gets smarter, and they will slowly build them up because there are some huge problems of liability to going straight to smart. So you'll do it incrementally and in, in, you know, make the insurance companies happy by doing it that way. So there's that, that incremental approach. Those are two ways. Um, but I think, I mean, many of the cases in the, in the climate modeling stuff, they have to throw out that color, which is beyond hope. I mean, you, I don't know if you read the East Anglia controversy, right? The emails from the guys in the University of East Anglia who were doing climate models, and they confessed that they fudged a bit of the data, and they, you know, um, they didn't know what this chunk of code was there, but we better leave it there just in case it does something. You know, I mean, in that case, we just got to throw it out and start again with modern software engineering. That's what you internet and talking about life supporting systems outside Earth as well as underwater communities. Does this take that into account? So you think we, could, we might escape the planet? If we use up this planet, we could go to another one? Not so much. Or, <laughs> I mean, that, I don't know what you mean by life supporting systems outside the planet. Right, right. colonizing and habit. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's sort of. Some people believe that's one approach that we should be pursuing. I mean, I, I don't personally think it's realistic, but, uh, um, and people are building, you know, offshore rafts and floating cities and so on and so forth. Uh, there's another way to do it. I mean, if these things could be built, you know, completely self-contained and self-sustaining, which I think, you know, people are coming close to being able to do, that might be, for a small number of people, that might be reasonable, but I think, We've got the planet we've got, and we have to use it better than we're using it. That's my own view. That's where I put my energy. Yeah. To me, the ultimate irony might be to discover that we can have a sustainable planet, but we don't, for various social political reasons. Yeah. So it's great that you sort of presented this as a technical challenge. Uh, just speaking non-technically, what do you think are the impediments or the obstacles or the barriers to actually achieving any of this? Uh, well, <laughs> how about the federal government is one of them. <laughs> I mean, we have people who just won't believe the evidence. You know, we have people who say the climate is not warming. You know, global, climate change is not happening. I think there are fewer and fewer, but unfortunately, they're in positions of power and. You know, Canada is going to yet another conference. They already pulled out of the Kyoto Accord. We're nowhere close to meeting the goals that we set for ourselves 15 years ago. Um, government scientists are being muzzled, who, the ones who work on this problem in the federal government, uh, for political reasons. I mean, until we can you know, have the truth be told and look at the evidence, then that's a problem. And that's a political problem. And we should all do what we can to change that situation. Uh, because. And, and the other one, of course, is you know the biggest industry on the planet is the oil industry, the oil and gas industry. Right? And it's in their interest to make sure that we get every last ton of that stuff out of the ground and burn. Right? And it's our interest as, as as humans to make sure that doesn't happen, based on the numbers I showed you. So, you know, we have to do things like get UBC to divest from investing in those companies. So the divestment movement is very powerful in the U.S. It's just getting started in Canada, and there's a movement happening right on campus in the last couple of days to make that happen. I think, you know, as responsible scientists, we should say this is the evidence, this is what we should be doing, and as individual citizens, we should we should stand up and act and and say this is what need, we think needs to happen based on what we see the evidence to be. But I'm not speaking there as a scientist. I'm speaking as a citizen. Um, so those are some of my answers. Sorry, isn't that an example of a piece of sustainability that goes beyond computation? <laughs> Not believing really this. How do you figure out how much of UBC's portfolio is invested in, in oil and gas? I bet you'd need a computer to do that. <laughs> but yes, there are many aspects. I'm not saying all sustainability is computational. Not at all. Not at all. But uh, I think much more of it is than we realized. I and mean, much more it could be if we pushed hard in this direction.
So you said some very interesting things in the beginning about the history of computing and how it was very focused on you know making do with very limited computational resources and how that really changed. And then towards the end of that slide, you were saying, well, you know, now power is the big constraint, and indeed, you know, that might force us to go back to sort of, you know, some of the things perhaps that, that they did in the 60s. So am I misunderstanding that, or, or do you really see that happening? And what no. I mean here is, of course, that, you know, although we might have very, very fast processors and stuff, the battery capacity is just not growing very fast, and especially for computation that happens on vessels like these nice ocean gliders that you saw, there might be a huge benefit in actually not making use of the enormous computational power that we could harness, but actually do with as little as possible. And I think in pervasive computing, this would generally turn out to be true, sustainability or not. Yeah, I don't think it means going back to the 60s, but I, I think... Um... What I mean by that, just to be clear, is that that you start worrying about small constant factors, which for a while we really didn't. True, yes. Yeah. Because we clearly, we, we all worry about a, a factor of 1.5 in battery life. Right, absolutely. So getting through the day or not getting through the day. <laughs> right. Um, but there's, I mean, I, I mean, you have a point, but I, I, for example, power conserving programming, what would that look like? I mean, would that mean, um, you wouldn't compute everything you could compute. You'd only compute what you have to compute when you need it. You know, sort of lazy computing, lazy evaluation, etc., which has been around for a long time in sort of functional programming. Um, but in real-time situations, you know, that some of those ideas come in, and um, so I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done there, and people are doing interesting work in that space. Um, there'll always be constraints. Yeah, that's, that's clear, and that's what I believe. <laughs> But the constraints change, um, and the constraint is not is not the speed; it's the power in this case for those kinds of applications. You know, where you're worried about that. But if you know, if you're on, I mean, that ocean a glider has quite a lot of power available to it because it's got a lot of a lot of sunshine, generating it quite a bit. It does have to conserve it, and it and it conserves it by just transmitting to satellites when they're directly overhead instead of, you know, so it uses the least power to transmit to the satellite. It's always managing its energy budget, and that's probably one of its most important things. Um, but I'm not saying the constraints have gone away, they, are, they change. You know. um, in light of the Gaia theory, in terms of how the world always reaches homeostasis, like how can computation actually like aid it? Like the constraints are constantly changing, so right. So it's like a dynamic constraint thing. So how can that ever like lead to something being solved? Is my question. Being solved. So so you're saying how could how could the Gaia hypothesis be true? Yeah. Well, it is controversial, and um, um, I mean, it, so it's a question of whether you consider the planet to be the, the biophysical system or you include humans in the loop, for one thing. If you include the humans, then, then we do have this ability to understand, hey, we've got a problem, we've got a crisis. Although, you know, we're in the boiling frog problem that this has been creeping up on us and it's outside the time frame of most governments, so they don't care about it. But people are waking up. They are doing something about it. Uh, so in that sense, you could, if you think, the planet includes humankind, then it can be self-sustaining and self-corrected. At least it appears to be self-corrected. But there, I mean, there is a lot of evidence that you know. I showed you a slide in which showed you know it didn't matter up to a certain point how many parts per million of CO2 you had in the atmosphere in terms of the effect on the ice. Uh, and that has suddenly mattered. And that's pretty typical. You know, that, that, I mean, natural systems are robust. They're robust because of evolution. You know, species have evolved in a dynamic environment, and they can't, it's not a fixed dynamic environment, it, it always drifts. And so, in order to be able to survive and prosper and have offspring, you need to be robust against changes in your environment. So, um, Many natural systems are robust in that sense. Of, you know, and there's a fairly clear theory, dynamical systems theory of what these basins of attraction look like and 
you know, what kinds of, of dynamical equations will give you a stable system versus an unstable. There are various kinds of stability. I mean, the, the theory of dynamical systems going back to Lyapunov is very rich in analyzing the kinds of stability and when they arise and when they don't arise. And, and um, Lovelock was saying, well, it happens, the Earth we're on is one of these with, that has very stable basins of attraction. So, so let me offer a comment on that and see what Alan thinks about that. You said that the constraints are changing all the time, and I'm wondering, and this is doubtlessly true, but I'm wondering whether that's the most relevant piece here. It might be that more relevant is that the active constraints are changing all the time, right? The ones that we're bumping into, whereas the others are there and they're kind of irrelevant for the time being. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And the other thing is the comment about evolution. I think that's doubtlessly true, but I'm wondering whether, you know, human intelligence amplified by computation um, has basically only the, the impact on this dynamical system that we can push it even further away from the safe region into, the, into that twilight zone and still have a hope of coming back, right? My, my feeling is that natural evolution and the geophysical system has evolved um, for the most part under conditions that were very different and where the kind of dynamics that we're imposing on it by means of our action at a global scale didn't play a role. And therefore, I think the system probably doesn't have resilience against that kind of thing built in, just as it didn't have a great deal of resilience against you know, big meteorites uh, built into it and probably never will, right? And so my feeling there is that perhaps computation allows us to stretch the safe, the safe zone and then the recoverable zone quite a bit further, mm -hmm. hopefully enveloping the state that we're in now. What do you think of that? Um, yeah, that stimulates some ideas. So um, the active constraints. So, so one of the, I was thinking of starting this talk with the thing that sustainability and computation have in common is the unintended side effect, right? So when we started burning fossil fuels in the 17th century and building steam engines and James Watt and developed a theory of feedback control based on Watt and Maxwell's equations and so on. Because Maxwell actually developed theory of feedback control as well as theories of electromagnetism. <laughs> um, we didn't think, hey, um, there's a problem in that we're taking all this carbon, which is safely buried in the form of coal and oil and so on, and put it into the atmosphere. What would be the effect of that? We didn't have ways of understanding that, although in 1932, there was a paper saying this is a problem. You know? So 80 years ago, it was recognized as a problem. It was immediately denied by all the climatologists who said, oh, no, it's nonsense. This guy was an amateur, right? So <laughs> they ignored him for a while. But eventually he came back and he got some credit for it. So two centuries later, we realized, oh, there was an unintended side effect. And this is true of every technology. Anytime you invent something, like a computer or a steam engine, there'll be things you hadn't thought of. And the, the trick is to catch them before they blow you up. So um, in this case, we may have woken up too late. We may not. We just, the jury's out. We'll just see. But it's possible that using computation, using these computational models, we, there wouldn't be nearly as much awareness if we didn't have these computational models to show people and show we can back project to show that they're valid by you know, back projecting the data and so on and so forth. Um, so computation plays a huge role and it may help us solve that problem, but again, there's this, this thing of unintended side effects and sometimes they, you know, as with the, the dinosaurs, they go extinct due to that large meteorite. And this may be <laughs> a large meteorite that we launched at ourselves. <laughs> may go extinct, unlikely. Uh, but we're going to be living further north than we used to. Not sure we want to close on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's another question. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't think my message was negative. I think I'm saying, you know, we have an opportunity as a chance uh, to do an enormous amount of good. There's, there's a lot of leverage we can get uh, with these systems. Um, just by doing demonstration projects of the kind, some of the kinds that I showed, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and this is starting to happen in many areas of computer science now. 
So I'm, I'm personally very hopeful that this, this kind of work will lead to much better solutions and will help contribute to solving the problem. It won't solve the problem. Contribute to solving the problem. That's the main message. Good. Well, then on that note, I think we can end confidently and thank you once again for the wonderful presentation.